Hi and welcome to another episode of the State of the Net podcast. I am Paolo Valdemarin. And I'm Ewan Semple. And uh, it has been a while since our last uh, recording. Something that I wanted to start from, which I think is interesting, and I read uh, this summer, is uh, an article on Ars Technica describing the talking about the 50th anniversary of uh, the creation of Unix at uh, Bell Labs. And it was a pretty interesting article because it basically tells the story in, in some detail. And uh, it described this situation of uh, uh, Bell Labs having a huge amount of money because at that point uh, basically all the money that AT&T was making in the United States was going to one place and they could afford to hire a whole number of very clever scientists and mathematicians and and researchers and kind of let them play in a Ooh. in a in a very large building and uh, and a group of these were involved in a in in a project that collapsed and uh, they found themselves with a lot of free time of course this being bell labs they wouldn't they didn't get fired they just were there with nothing to do and they managed to steal some time from other computers they could get their hands on and they created uh, um, unix which is uh, basically if you if you don't have a windows pc everything else is running on some version of unix i mean mac os uh, bios android linux uh, everything is unix so i thought it was interesting how this uh, self organized situation basically created such an important uh, uh, you know foundation for today's technology and 50 years later is still the most important thing you could almost i'm just as you were describing that wondering whether you know the degree to which there have ever been any examples of pre-planned creativity <laughs> you know in the sense that almost everything that's been innovative over the last few decades and certainly in terms of technology has been a a skunk works unofficial people messing around tinkering sort of a at least in the very early stages uh, project you know it's it's even if the bits of bigger projects that were maybe planned those separate bits were almost always you know somehow it seems intuitively how people create is in those loose uh networks and loose loose purpose if you like that they're not quite sure when they start off what they're going to achieve um and yet you know the conventional modern management culture is sort of terrified of that prospect of people just doing their own thing and messing around you know it's we mitigate against it all the time well i think that to some degree it's uh that kind of environment is ideal if you want new things to happen um if you want to then elaborate and evolve and sure. uh I mean, I, I've been watching recently, I, I've been drawn into one of those uh, uh, YouTube sinkholes about uh, rocket science. Mm. Uh, I, I, I mostly started uh, following the recent presentation that Elon Musk made of his new shiny starship. And uh, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, Elon Musk is probably the worst public speaker you've ever heard but he's speaking of, basically he talks about stuff that's so amazing and interesting that actually i i spent an hour or more watching this it's uh, it's i mean look it's much more interesting to see new stuff from spacex there's new stuff from apple these days and mm -hmm. it's it's the same type of keynote type, keynote event mm -hmm. and you know you you can't do that just Putting a bunch of guys in a room, it's it's a type of thing that requires a lot of research and work and applied and structure. Even if he's doing in a diff, diff, in a way which is completely different from the traditional uh, Boeing or NASA approach, and he's iterating at a much much faster uh, rhythm than than all the others. So there is something. Yeah, we've we've, there we've talked about this before on the podcast. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you run a whole business on that basis and. Certainly, as we've definitely talked about, you know, my current experience of the processes and systems that allow me to drive goods safely around and being able to predict what I take, where and when. It's incredibly complex and 
effective and rigid. I mean, it has to be. It has to work. It can't, you can't be making it up every bloody time, you know. Um, so I mean, no, no illusions about that. But we, we started off talking about the innovation and the creativity. And I guess the thing is getting the right balance. And I know another story that you shared with me before we started was Google and how you know, it used to drive me nuts how the BBC, which in my day used to, I thought, be very good at managing the balance between creativity and the need to deliver, basically screwed itself, shot itself in the foot and made it difficult to do that and then took people on tours to Google to see how they did it. And it never felt right. Uh, in the same way as we work, never felt right to me. There was always a sort of slightly... I don't know, just a gut feeling about it. It didn't feel authentic. It, it was sort of manipulative. Or, and, so, and so Google, you know, Google and, 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 and WeWork are now struggling because it wasn't maintained as sufficiently part of the culture. It's, got, it's gone wrong in both cases. I think that uh, the early days of Google were sincere to some degree. I mean, I, I think that the early days of Google were working on a model very similar to to Bell Labs 50 years ago. Yeah. was, yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of brilliant people, pretty much let alone to play. Many of the ideas at Google came from uh, people developing projects on their own time, and, uh, and it was a very effective uh, approach. Then the company had to grow That's and, right. of course, right. become bigger and bigger. And I think that so there is a, another interesting article that I read on Wired about the, the struggle in the last three years at Google. And, uh, and, it's, and they're really struggling with diversity and internal infighting mm -hmm. in groups and discrimination and, uh, and, and people connecting to the press outside the company, triggering all kind of ripple effects. Uh, the, the description of this article, I'll, I'll, I'll post the links in the description, but it's, it's, it's really about a company struggling trying to find a balance and where this initial core team and this initial culture of... Uh, to be honest, uh, you know, mostly white and probably some Asian dudes uh, coming up with ideas had an impact on a modern, diverse culture, and the two are are really struggling to coexist. And, uh, yeah, and, and needn't, I think needn't... that to some degree they have lost the old way and they haven't found a new way yet. Yeah, and it needn't be as overt as racial or gender or whatever differences even within homogenous groups I mean it's I've often thought it's something about scale you know this is why gore keep every time they begin to grow they just chop themselves back into small pieces of a particular size I can't remember it's not the Dunbar number but it's like that uh, because they know that once the that section gets bigger than that it becomes this other beast and you start to accrete you know people at like HR and comms and you know, what I've often called the perils of professionalization, things that a group could potentially and should handle themselves suddenly become outsourced to other people within the organization. And then it starts to go wrong. They become ends in themselves. They begin to build processes and systems that are self-preserving rather than necessarily driving. Driving. Did I just say the word driving? Shoot me. Um, helping things move forward, you know. Um and I'm, I'm more and more convinced that it's sort of inevitable once you get to a certain... Unless you make some really clever and careful, careful interventions, it seems inevitable that once, just by stint of, dint of numbers, tribalism or other things begin to prevail. I mean, it, it's interesting, Paolo, because I, was just, I met up with Dave Snowden during the week, and uh, we were talking about structure and lack thereof, and we're remembering that debate, if that's the right word for it, he and I had in, in Milan at a state of the net about, you know, on the spectrum of fascism to anarchism, what other alternatives there are in the middle and the mm -hmm. different types of interventions and how even benign interventions can have negative effects on complex interconnected environments. And, you know, again, this is a theme we've talked about many times on this podcast. It's just really interesting to consider what are appropriate ethically motivated interventions to help things to happen that don't make things worse. 
I mean, look at politics. I mean, that's the same thing at the moment, isn't it? Just, just they haven't a bloody clue how to intervene and, and improve things. I think that probably we're struggling with the... Uh, we, were, we were, as we said in another episode, there is always the, the stories that we tell ourselves to to explain and to some degree the stories that we all believe into in order to be able to function as a society. And I think that we're mm. struggling creating these new stories. I yeah. mean, there are a lot of influences in... Uh, I mean, even from the point of view of how manipulation through social media of of reality happens, everybody's create. You have a lot of fake news stories mm -hmm. that uh, that are used as a base for discussion, and uh, it's becoming hard to to wade through all these all, all these information. Yeah. So. Yeah. Trying to trying to have a positive effect on anything, it's uh, it's it's hard. I mean, w what they were describing at Google is how anybody with an agenda inside the organization nowadays can find uh, a news outlet uh, ready to follow up, ready to follow the story, ready mm -hmm. to you know turn anything into a scandal. Regardless of what the position is, I mean, it can be far right, can be far left, can be anywhere in between, and uh, and it's so easy to amplify very quickly the smallest signal that uh, that uh, managing this process or even try to steer or influence the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is. Uh, even inside an organization, becomes becomes very hard. So on one side, you have this large organization to just so blindly believe that uh, that HR is useful, uh, or that you know they all they all follow the same story. And and from time to time, you do have the feeling that uh, you know the the emperor is naked as you look at these things and say, but it's it's all. Bullshit. I mean, why are why, why is everybody behaving like that? But you know, everybody is following a, a common story, but they're clinging to the story because everything else seems unhinged and dangerous. Yeah. And that's why I think we're seeing more of it. That's why populism works, isn't it? Because in the face of unpredictability and and potential chaos, almost any story is better than none. It it provides a simple story that uh, that you can that anybody can understand. It's mm. it's much it's much more comforting than it's all chaos. It's all right. it's all it, it's a huge, uh, unpredictable and complex system where the truth is we have no idea how it works and 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 how to deal with it and uh, just leave with this because it's the only way you, the only way forward but um, part part of it is our inclination it's our misguided feeling that we're sort of meant to be in charge of ourselves and and a feeling i'm increasingly aware of that actually life life is happening it's happening all the time and we can't stop it happening and we're not in control of it happening and 99% of the things that well more than that all of the things that happen to us are out of our control. They're part of incredibly complex environments that have millennia of history, all of which was necessary for this moment to have arrived now. And to try and take responsibility for any of that is what drives us nuts, uh, because we're not. And uh, it's almost like this culture has convinced us that there's a right way, that there's a... We should be more happy than sad. That um, if we make a, a, an appropriate intervention, we can make that more likely than not to happen. You know, none, none of which is actually true, you know. And that's what and I think we're beginning to realise that. And that's part of why we've got so much stress at the moment because th thing that that's what's falling apart is that misguided sense of of of, of being able to control things. Because when you relax and are more interested in what's happening and being open to what's happening then you react differently and you don't bugger things up you don't intervene weirdly you don't manipulate you don't try to control you're much more willing to listen to what other people are saying and hear them instead of just trying to come up with the next argument and I, you know, I'm more and more convinced that that 
set of skills is something that would help us uh, to, to, to be in tune with life rather than fighting it all the time. I just finished reading a, a, a book titled How the World Thinks by mm. Julian Baggini, mm-hmm. which is a, a, a history of... It's basically, it's a, it's a very simple book about uh, comparative philosophy. And uh, it, it is quite interesting how it uh, it analyzes uh, philosophy, Eastern philosophy, from China to Japan, India, mm-hmm. with uh, modern Western philosophy, and African philosophy, and it's uh, and how there are some amazingly similar common aspects, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but the also how there are these very different uh, approaches of you know the understanding of uh, the position of the individual in respect yeah. of society in respect of others and uh, and you know what is reasonable to expect uh, and it's um, i think it, it it's what is very interesting about this book is how it, it compares things from different cultures and uh, and in, in to some degree trying to Suggest how you can learn from 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 differences and how differences are mm-hmm. actually uh, the the most interesting part, uh, if you want. I'll need to try and bring myself to read one of his books again because I met him once and he was distinctly unfriendly, so it ra- rather put me off reading another of his books. But he does write interesting stuff. Uh, I mean, th- th- this was I I actually just uh, I I listened to the audio book and mm-hmm. it's uh, it was it was good it it, it was very interesting. Mm. And it's uh, and it's uh, and and you do hear a lot about uh, how, as uh, humans, and and probably to some degree as Western humans, we we try to always find our position and our and, and try to justify and and create yeah. a story about uh, yeah. where we are it. as yeah. uh, individuals and defend it as opposed for example in you know most eastern philosophies it it's much more how you are related to the others and mm-hmm. how the, the the good of the group is is the most important uh, aspect yeah but um yeah, so you have decided to stop uh, using Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on the brink of it. Um, I think I probably will. I mean, the issues are that I have for a while been been nostalgic for the earlier world of blogging, and not just because it was a small group of people, but, but because it was a different thing. It was a different rhythm. Um the way you read other people's thoughts uh, didn't come in a, a, a fire hose. Um, it wasn't accompanied by kind of algorithmically de- de- driven noise around it. Um, the networking wasn't sort of driven by likes. It was by discovering somebody interesting, following their blog, blog role and finding somebody else interesting. And that kind of handcrafted, slower moving, more thoughtful form of networking, mm-hmm. which became bastardised into social networking, is something that still holds an appeal. And I've been in a sort of halfway house for the last couple of years where I've replicated my blog posts into Facebook and originally LinkedIn, but I, I kind of gave up on LinkedIn about six months ago. And I'm feeling uh, an inclination to do the same with Facebook. And as I said this morning, I'm aware there would be a cost. I mean, I have a lot of connections in Facebook. I have some really interesting conversations in Facebook. And having sort of started to dig back into blogging, commenting on blogs is still a mess. It's still all over the place. It's still hard to track whether somebody's responded to your comment on somebody else's blog. And all of that Facebook made so much easier because it just, I had the mechanisms to keep you aware of what was happening, who was responding to who. So there's a definite downside to moving out. Um, so I haven't definitely decided to do it. But what was interesting was, having posted about that, people's comments and people have shared their blog posts and their links to their blogs. And I've actually had a very enjoyable day reading some longer and thoughtful posts, which I would have missed otherwise. So it's kind of reinforced my gut instinct that this might be a sensible thing to do. 
Did you find a RSS reader that you like? Well, I mean, I've never stopped using RSS, so I use a feed managing thing called Inno Reader, which you can, it's got its own apps, but I pay a small subscription to them to give me the chance to subscribe to blogs or RSS feeds generally. And then I mm -hmm. use, I kind of keep swapping the different apps on the iPhone and the iPad around, but I'm currently using Fiery Feeds. Um, I used to use Reader for quite a long time, and that's partly, again, how they allow me to, you know, strip images out, um, not be overwhelmed by the amount of feeds coming in and, and just let me manage them a bit better. So, um, so I've not, like I said, I've always been doing that alongside using Facebook. So it's already there waiting for me. I mean, I might shift my blog. It's on Squarespace at the moment. I might shift it to WordPress because it's got, I think, better plugins for building a blog role or posting from other places like Mars Edit or uh, Ulysses, which is one of the writing apps that I use. But, I'm, you know, and I don't want to end up just disappearing into a tech hole where I just tinker with things and don't write. But I suppose that that's the point. It's an inclination to do better, more thoughtful writing and reading, which is what it was always about for me in the first place. Well, I mean, I, I, I have to admit that if you were to stop posting your stuff on Facebook, I I would probably f f make a little, at least a little effort to try to follow you wherever else you're writing oh, thanks, stuff. Thanks, because, Paolo. Uh, you say the nicest things. I, no, no, but <laughs> I mean, a, I, a little, a I guess. <laughs> I well, you know, I don't. I would try. Okay, I'm not saying that I'm going to make it, but I, I, I'll try. Now, I, I guess that that my main concern about leaving um, Facebook is that. Uh, and recently, I fired up a reader again and and actually refreshed, and I actually found that there were a bunch of bloggers that uh, from the old days that are still around, mm -hmm. but it's a very small number. Yes, I mean, of my reduced. old list, of, all, all my old list of uh, of feeds, probably there are three or four that are still yeah. alive. I'm the same. And uh, and 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 so to to some degree, my concern is, uh, yeah, I I can go, I can st stop posting stuff on Facebook. Well, I'm not posting anything on Facebook to say that I'm not posting anything anywhere to be honest I mean the only thing that I post from time to time is is photos on Instagram but um, so I, I guess I'm not very good with contributions at the moment except for for podcasting uh, but even even just in terms of reading is uh, I, I would have to sort of try to redevelop uh, yes a, yes. a, a, a library of, of interesting things and, and I suppose that because when we started blogging and it's different if you're an active citizen and you're contributing it's it's something it's something else I mean mm -hmm. honestly Facebook may be may be lazy and yeah uh, that's, that's most that's of the, the time yeah. it's, it's it's a little bit of a uh, I'm not the kind of person who likes to argue on the internet so i just let most things go and at some point i decided it's not worth sharing anything because uh, who cares and because i couldn't be bothered with uh, <laughs> discussing with people yeah uh which is which, which is, is which is, is a valid position to take i mean that's the, you know i may end up there myself i mean that's that's you know one of the possible outcomes of this is that i just drift away from it um it is true that that uh, these days Facebook is not very interesting from the point of view of uh, the people, in the sense that uh, you know how we always say, you know, if you don't like your Facebook feed, is because you have the wrong kind of friends. Yeah. The point is that in my Facebook feed, I don't see people almost anymore. I mean, most of what is in my feed is. Uh, Stuff produced by professional content producers yeah, yeah, totally, that somehow totally. ended, I, I ended up being subscribed to. It. Well, so that's that's what that's what triggered it. That was what triggered it. I was walking through. I was I was going through Twitter, and all these posts that were showing me things because other people that happened to be peripherally in my network followed this thing, and I'm thinking I don't want that. That's so much noise, you know. And and I've started. I was having quite a good time this morning, just blocking everything because I was so fed up with it, you know. Um, and it was that that made me think again, you know, I, I want 
thoughtful post. I want nice people to connect with, interesting people to connect with. And it, it, it in some ways, is easier if, if they blog. I mean, who knows? I mean, blogging might have the same sort of renaissance that podcasting's apparently having at the moment. Um, you know, we'll see. Oh, it's, I mean, something, something interesting that happened recently is that uh, uh, Dave Weiner plugged his blog into... Uh, script that email it's emailing the, the you know a day of blogging at the end of every day mm-hmm. and uh, and because he had stopped posting on Facebook as well I I mean curiously I was connected to him I was seeing some of the stuff he was writing but not everything goes on was going on on his blog and now I'm getting it in the morning yeah. uh, with my email and it's uh, and it's actually quite interesting I sort of rediscovered reading scripting news yeah and uh, it's probably probably it is scalable because I mean if it's the same amount of information that you would that would be in an RSS feed uh, it just happened to yeah. be in my uh, mail client yeah I mean I've, I, I said to you I mean I've had a MailChimp uh group that allows me to share my blog post through email because I think it's still a case of well this was part of why I ended up on Facebook in the first place of going to where people are uh, rather than where you think they should be and Mm -hmm. if most people use email more than they do any of the social media tools or if they would find RSS feeds and aggregators a bit of a technology challenge then don't make it hard for them you know don't be elitist about it but, but now you want to. <laughs> well, uh, that's why I paused. You had I enough. I know. Well, I know. Yeah, screw them. <laughs> but that. Well, that's the. Well, that's actually. Let me. Let me just rephrase that. This is partly what's beginning to put me off Facebook. There are there are lots of people that I know who are smart, who are interesting, but it's still a lot of noise on Facebook. And it's just this feeling of of not having life's too short for that amount of noise. And, and I guess that even if they are on Facebook, are they posting anything interesting as part? Because that's the other problem. That's right, that and, so and, and I suppose the, the answer is not enough. There's a lot of resharing of things. There's a lot of resharing of angry things. There's a lot of resharing about things about Brexit or Trump or whatever. And I understand that it's well motivated, and I understand that it's because people care. And in a, in a, in a oblique sort of way, then they may bring about some change by making more people aware of the same things that they care about and blah, blah, blah. But it's a, I, I think it's almost back to ownership because with a blog, it's your blog and you're very aware of the fact that it's your, or we were very aware of the fact that it's your presence on the internet. So I think you're a bit more careful about what you write there rather than shooting your mouth off or being Mr. Angry on Twitter or Facebook, which felt... Unconstrained. I think that I think that there is also the aspect of the kind of of uh, feedback that you are expecting to get on a blog mm-hmm. post, or mm-hmm. if you post something. Totally. I mean, if you post something on Facebook, it, you do it because you want to get recognition, because you want to get likes, because you get want to. Uh, yes, and that's, that's something I want you, to stop. I, I, I've, I've, I've become aware that I'm too affected by that. And I'm beginning to think, no, I just want to write something because I want to write it and I'll post it and I'll not worry whether people like it or not. Well, I I guess that the interesting thing is that if you raise the the threshold of engagement a little bit, probably what will come through will be a little bit bit, people who want to do a little bit more, they want to, to, to have a little bit more of an effort in trying to, to do something or to react to what you're doing, probably are going to give you something better than just... Uh, I mean, likes are cheap, right? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, it's, I used to think this about the wiki simple. that we had at the Beeb, that when people used to have to write wiki markup in order to be able to contribute, the quality mm-hmm. was higher because <laughs> it took effort. And then all of a sudden you got a WYSIWYG interface and all sorts of stuff just started filling it up. It's like the old joke about, we're talking, it's funny to go full circle and back to the beginning of the podcast. I remember an old IT guy saying once, you know, if you want to sort out your corporate computing, make Unix the standard platform. And if the buggers can't work out how to use it, then they shouldn't have a computer. And and I've always had a degree of sympathy for that view. And I suppose the same could be said of social media. If you can't be bothered setting up a blog 
and working out how to use RSS feeds, then whatever, you know. That's terrible. Forgive me, whoever's listening to this. I think that I think that there, that uh, probably the time will come. I, I, I'm not. I, it's hard to say if it is now, but the time will come for a new, yeah, renaissance of uh, of. I mean, it it cannot be it it cannot be just about this, right? I yeah, mean, exactly. If, it's if, not if, over if this yet. Is, it, no. uh, yeah, it's it's not over yet. It's it's the very beginning. You know, we, we say, oh, Unix, uh, it's been around for fifty years. Fifty years is nothing in no. the history of of, totally. of thinking and evolution. So, yeah, things are moving forward. Things will change. Uh, I, but who knows? Is it going to be blogging or email or what or podcasting? But. Uh, Let's say that what is certain is that uh, we need to go somewhere from here, and uh, not necessarily, but but it might be that we have touched the bottom, so the only way direction we can go is up. Uh, and uh, if we look at the <laughs> there are many aspects of, of life uh, at the moment that feel like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to to some degree, the uh, the, the aspect of social media, uh, then there is also the we probably see a very small and very partial slice of social media. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, I, I, I check Facebook. I Sometime I have a look at Twitter. I just full of angry people and probably because I know angry people. It's it's all my fault, but I don't enjoy <laughs> that. And I don't I don't know how to go and find other nicer people to put in my in my stream. But then there is plenty of other platforms and services and feeds and systems that uh, I'm completely not aware of. Yeah. Um, there is also, if I see how um, younger people use the very same, I mean, uh, from time in the, on the tube, you just overlook somebody, you know, using their phone next to you and see how, how people use yeah, uh, yeah. messaging on Instagram, for yeah, example. Yeah. I mean, I never use messaging on Instagram. I don't even. I mean, I know it's there, but I don't see. I don't really see the point. Yeah. Uh, but actually, it's a very used platform for a lot of conversation. That's right. There is a lot of. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, private uh, WhatsApp group or Facebook groups of. of private areas of conversation that I don't see, I'm not a part of, I mm -hmm. don't care particularly, mm -hmm. but are actually are mainstream. So yeah. I think there is a whole number of uh, phenomena that, that we are just not not aware of because we're all well, and, and I think, bloggers. You know, a good, <clears throat> unlike when we started, and I've realised it's nine, 18 years, no, hang on. Yeah, next February it'll be 19 years that I've been blogging. And, um, you know, that that is quite a long time, and one of the things that has significantly changed in that time is the number of people who are on the internet in whatever form. And mm -hmm. um, many, many more people making good use of it and, and getting benefit from it and becoming aware of the issues and thinking about the issues. And yes, there's all the noise and there's the dissent and there's the polarisation and all the shit that we're going through at the moment. But, you know, when I'm being nostalgic for blogging, it's not for a small niche nice bunch of my friends is more for the type of interactions that we had and the, the prospect of scaling those and having more people become interested in having that level of thoughtful conversation <clears throat> um, and tools that enhance that rather than make it difficult I think is what's what's still exciting you know yeah I mean I, I think that we we need to hope that there is going to be a maybe a next generation of, of bloggers with with a few old people in tow, and maybe it won't be bloggers. I'm, 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 you know, using bloggers as a proxy for whatever yes. technology. Yes, whatever. whatever yeah, exactly. Thing. It's a way of looking at things rather than a tool. But, but I mean, actually talking about youngsters and watching my daughters and the whole thing about influencers and and YouTube and the way YouTube still has massive appeal for a lot of people and. Listen to them and their conversations and them and their friends of their generation working out who's contributing and who's not and what the consequences are and the frustration and intolerance of the intervention of marketing and prepackaged and, and manipulative feeds into those streams is something they're way more educated about than, than 
pe- people generally were 20 years ago, 19 years ago. And that, again, is a good thing, you know, that they are spending all the time in these places and given human nature, a lot of them will want that to be a worthwhile way of spending their time. So I'm, again, optimistic that we will work this out and we'll, we'll, we'll increase the quality and the, and the range. And I still think... It, although it has an ability to exacerbate silo thinking and polarisation, it also makes it more obvious than ever before that we are connected in ways that we can't avoid. <laughs> and that keeps me hopeful. It's about finding a new balance. I mean, I, I don't remember the name of the company, but um, do you remember that at some point in the early days of blogging, there was an organisation that came up with the idea of paying bloggers for posts. And Mark Cantor was somehow involved with it. I mean, he tried to recruit some bloggers for for Vaguely, this. Vaguely, yes. And, and it and it was I mean there was outrage everywhere it said you know this is the corruption of the future mm, it yeah. was uh, it was really I think that it went down in flames or 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 maybe it's a multi billion dollars multinational at the moment I'm not sure but uh, it was uh, it was really frowned upon and uh, you know if you look at influencers these days and if you look at a lot of content these days it's all about uh, yeah yeah. People getting paid for that. But and you see, but, that's, uh, but there's different ways of getting paid. I mean, I, I, you know, when I grump about my Twitter feed being full of noise and pollution, it's because of the interests of marketing or, or PR to make it so. And I, I maintain I would pay, I would happily pay 10 quid a month to get the noise out, to, ha- to have an advertising and manipulation-free environment. Um but I then am aware that people who contribute need recognised and rewarded in some way. And, you know, that tantalising prospect of micropayments that's been around since the start is still there, look, you know. Uh, uh, but, but to be fair, it's not even micropayment. I mean, how many subscriptions do you pay these days? I mean, I don't know you, me, a stupid amount. Because, I mean, you pay... I pay for Netflix, I pay for Prime, I pay for Apple Music. Yep. Uh, I mean, yep. I'm, I'm probably not going to convert, but I, I, there is going to be Apple TV next month. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, there is an Apple Arcade. I'm not paying for that, but, you know, I might. Uh, there is a subscription. I mean, how many subscription? I mean, it's several hundred pounds a month, I think, yep. that goes into subscriptions. So if I was to pay five pounds, ten pounds a month, whatever, for Facebook or Twitter, I mean, it would just be lost in the yeah. many subscriptions that you pay anyway. That's right. So I, I'm, I'm sort of wondering why they haven't tried. I, I mean, know. Given the success, and even if it's not the whole Netflix business model, and the other so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not expecting them to throw everything out and start again, but just at least let me do it. You know, why not? Yeah, but you know, you have. Two billion users, even if a very small percentage of those decide right. to start paying subscription, pretty good money. I'm probably. ruthlessly ignoring the bloody ads anyway, so there's no, you know, you might as well pay me money, or take my money rather, you know. Yeah, yeah, it would save time to everybody. Yeah, I reckon. Well, there we go. That's another free podcast. Quality that's priceless. Uh, shall we, if, shall if we say you, goodbye then, Paulo? <laughs> Yes, I, given that I don't think that anybody's going to send us uh, any cash today. Yeah, uh, unmarked notes and, and envelopes, please. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, <laughs> see you next time. Bye.